children, and I remember when um, and Kakai is coming and Art's coming. We were children, and I remember when our father, Bobby Hickman, and um, Kakai went out to work on Lead Belly with Uncle Gordon. And, um, and um, you might have seen, and I know he'll talk about it, Kakai, he had that, that scene in the movie. Church coming. Yeah. <laughs> and they'll talk about all of that. But it was just so amazing. And I'm, I'm just going to sit here in that chair and just bask and hear the stories. But I want to say that when I started the Choice Cinema Series in 2019, that was before the pandemic, the health pandemic and the racial pandemic that came in 2020 after the murder of George Floyd. But it was in, in my spirit to have this series honor Uncle Gordon, but also lift up again visionary black men who walked with Uncle Gordon. And I'm just so honored tonight to have on the stage visionary black men who walked with Uncle Gordon. Something that um, Kyle Johnson said, um, he says, it's wonderful to meet people who admired him, but there's something when you're with people and who got to actually kind of roll with him. And that's something I got to do since I was really little. Um, and he inspired not only what I do for a living as a media maker, but how I do it. And as I mentioned earlier, some my last visit with him, some of the things that he was concerned about, much fame, but when he was at the end of his life, knowing he was about to go to glory, he was most concerned about those young men who looked like him. When he was surviving on the streets, of St. Paul and the Rondo community, homeless, fighting violence and racism, right? So you, I hope that all of you go and dig deeper into that man that walked through it all and came and, and again with the words of his mother and his father and a community, a village that inspired him. And when the young people and the scholars of Gordon Parks High School went to the History Theater, first seeing their work, and I, again, I hope you get a chance to look at the work of the scholars in the exhibit. Um, those same portraits and uh, um, projects were on display at the History Theater. And when Gordon Parks High School came to see Parks' portrait of a young artist at the History Theater, young people who probably never imagined going to a theater to see a play. It was so amazing for them to see their work on the walls. And they loved the play. So Harrison Rivers nailed it because they had a, he wrote a play that captivated those young people. But Uncle Gordon's life story, many of them are living today. They come to Gordon Parks High School, and my dear friend, Dr. Teresa Battles, she knows this. They're couch hopping. They're living the lives that they saw on that stage, Uncle Gordon living. But in spite of they all, they're lifting up visions. And so we need you all to be ambassadors and dig deeper. Don't just look at the man for his fame. But in spite of it all, he was a young visionary, that lived to be 93 years old because we walk with young people that don't see lives past 21. And if we look at the media, they don't tell the narrative to many young people that they'd live beyond that. But we know better. So continue to walk with us and, and we have some visions. And walking with Amy and some others, uh, we're picking up the vision again to see Uncle Gordon stand over in Landmark Plaza we are picking up that statue project again. So we need you to help us to make sure he stands in downtown St. Paul. So we're just, well, we got Kakai. Everybody's back here? Here we go. I am so honored 
to introduce our guest, Kakai Ampa St. Paul Rondo's own and Art Evans Line Lemon. There he is. <laughs> he did. He did a leap down those stairs. <laughs> and with us, Craig Rice is not only moderating, but again, St. Paul's own <laughs> director, producer, extraordinaire. Yes, you can sit on that. And I'm sitting and just sitting and drinking some water and listening. <laughs> So thank you guys for coming. I really, really appreciate this. Um, um, yeah, so um, my name is Nick Craig Rice, and, and I was born, you know, in the Rondo neighborhood, actually 422 Fuller, which is not there anymore. But, um, you know, it's been a, a journey for me. And I, one of the things that, that, that Robin is sort of carrying on, I mean, she's actually carrying on a legacy of a legacy. Um, I was very, very influenced by Robin's father. Um, he had an organization um, when I was, decided that I didn't want to be the gangster that I thought I wanted to be. I really wanted to be, it was more about art. And he really had an organization that was really developing artistic uh, development in young people. And it was photography and they made a film in 1970, which is now part of the Minnesota Historical Society uh, and the Walker Archives, it was a feature film. Um, it really developed in me a desire to be creative. That, and Robert, her father, got that from Gordon, and he was bringing it to, to, the, to the next generation. And then Robin's bringing it to the next generation. So this is ro rolling. And I remember when I first met Gordon, um, I wanted him to understand that, that his, he had made such an incredible effect. He's almost like a, a wave that kept going out and coming back, come, going out and coming back and, and saving and propelling and moving S lots of young people forward, not just boys, but also women. And Robin is an example of that. Um, Kakai I've known for, uh, well, from that time frame, actually, um, from St. Paul. And Art, I, we, I was telling Art, I met Art um, in Ames, Iowa. I was, I was booking talent for um, uh, Minneapolis College, and I was 19 years old, and I met him in a group. And he, it's, he, his presence so impressed me that I followed him for the rest of my life. This is not the first time we met, but so it's great to be back on stage with him. And he, I won't even tell you how many years ago that was, but it was a while ago. So, but, um, so this aspect of, of the arts and entertainment and these gentlemen growing underneath the Gordon Parks influence is really, really there. I mean, we're here because of the process. There's one other thing that, that Robin, I don't know if you got this, Ernie Hudson's in this movie. It was, uh, it was an, uh, uh, from here, he's an actor, he's Oz and, and uh, uh, Gracie and, and uh, Ghostbusters, and, and I, I totally forgot that he was in this movie until I saw him in the film. Um, so again, that legacy continues to roll even today. Um, Grace and Frankie, that's the other series he's in right now. So um, this is part of what, what this is all about. Um, so I'm going to just ask a couple of questions here, and I just want to kind of... You can also get your car fixed, you know. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah. You pay that insurance to get your car fixed. Exactly. He's, he's less, less commercial, he can do that. Yeah. So I was going to just start with you, Kaka, since you were the first one here. Um, I want to just talk to you about, kind of give your background. I mean, this gentleman, for a lot of people don't understand, he is probably the preeminent location manager producer in Hollywood. He has worked with Spielberg and, and, and Clint Eastwood. Um, and, I, and I want to attempt to t just explain that because it's not a role that a lot of people understand and know. Could you, go, could you yeah, approach that? Um, really, it's really good to be here. And uh, thank you guys for having me. Use your mic, please. Yeah, here you go. We're recording this. Um, and, um, you know, everything, I. Craig talked about the Inner City Youth League uh, and Bobby Hickman. And Bobby was the director. I was the deputy director. Uh, it started there right out of high school, as well as started at KTCA right out of high school uh, at a program called Black Voices, uh, which was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, you know, to get some black people off the street, as really it was. It was 1968, so it was a lot happening at that time. But at working at the Inner City Youth League, uh, 
he had multiple jobs. Uh, one, I taught photography. The other was uh, we were in the community. We were, if there was an issue happening, we were there. Uh, so it meant dealing with a lot of government agencies. It meant dealing with the people of the community. Uh, and as I've said before, it was grad school for being a location manager. Uh, because a location manager, if you don't know, is a person who uh, at the beginning uh, takes the script and meets with the director, producer, uh, production designer, and they determine what's going to be, what locations are going to be shot off the studio or off the lot. And then we do the research uh, uh, through well, now computers or whatever, and then we contact film commissions and, you know, the architecture, the time period, all of that stuff is considered. Uh, and then we go out and actually uh, bring choices. Uh, and it's uh, something, first of all, to the production designer, and then it gets whittled down, and then it goes to the director and producer, and then it gets chosen. Uh, once that happens, now you've got to do the permits, you've got to do the contracts, you've got to figure out where all the trucks are going to park, where the, f the company is going to eat. Uh, if you're going to do stunts and all that stuff, you've got to coordinate with the police, the fire department. So that's what location management is, really is. It's all of that. But everything that you do or that I did for us taking the pictures of the locations, Inner City Youth League, uh, dealing with all those entities, Inner City Youth League. So basically, you learn the job, but that was with skills that I had already gathered here. Mm -hmm. Now, by being and working with Bobby, and Bobby allowing me, uh, Gordon would allow him to go and watch him make films, and, uh, and Bobby said, well, can, can Kakai come? And so the first one was the, the second Shaft movie, Shaft's Big Score, in, in New York. And I was just like, <laughs> Because we had made a film mm -hmm. with yeah. uh, Hampton Alexander, and it was us with you know a camera and a, it's a sound crew. I was uh, one of the a cinematographer, uh, uh, DP, camera operator, but we were lighting with you know uh, we had one real light, <laughs> and then we had you know like lamps. Yeah. If we needed if we needed more light, you take the shade off. You know what I mean? We were lighting with whatever we had and however we could. But we got a film out of it, you know, and uh, it, you know it's not something that really it didn't go into the uh, into the theaters, uh, but it is a completed film, and it's actually the first feature film totally produced by African Americans in the state of Minnesota, and so that's why it's in the uh, historical society. A young man by the name, the late Timmy McKinney, a young man wrote the well, wrote it and directed it, so we got to give him his propers and. Uh, but Bobby, being who he was, you know, you come to inner city and you say, I really want to do something. Yeah. And he would find a way for you to be able to do it. And he got the money together and we had this little camera. You know the cameras with the looks like Mickey Mouse's ears? I mean, we were, we were but we were making a film. And, uh, and so that got done. And it's, it, you know, so we, uh, we did that. But <clears throat> in terms of, and I'll just wrap this up because I'm done. Then I got to go to the second film uh, to watch him work, and that was Lead Belly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I wasn't so much in all of this now because I had had that experience. And Gordon says, now listen, you know, you ask anybody you want what they do. You know, this is a learning thing. So that's what I did. And I knew I was a production person having worked at KTCA. I wasn't an actor. Uh, and uh, Art, will, I'll tell you something, Art told me I wasn't an actor too, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, so I would spend a day, like I spent a day with Bruce Surtees, the DP, and he taught me about the use of the Kukaloris and how he was making the shadow effect. I spent the day with Doris Grau, who was the, uh, the script supervisor, and what she did and how she, her, dealing with continuity. Uh, Richard Wells um, and uh, Ruben, Watt, who were ADs, and that was a whole nother side of the business. Mm -hmm. And that, they were very rare at that time. Yeah, yeah. But, but Gordon had them on the picture. Yeah. And so one day, I'll give you these two things that happened. One day I was sitting on the set, we were in a place called Bastrop, Texas, which is right outside of Austin. 
And as you see some of those old scenes, Bastrop was a place that all you had to do was put dirt on the ground and you were back to the early 1900s, <laughs> right? So we were in Bastrop and this guy comes up, this white guy comes up to me who's on the crew and he says, can you do me a favor? And I said, well, yeah, what? He said, there's some people down the way. They've got a radio playing. Could you go down and talk to them and, and uh, ask them if they could turn it down? I said, well, yeah, you know. So I go down, and you know, it turns out it's a black family. He's, he just probably said, send you down there. It's <laughs> right. a black family. <laughs> right. So I go down, and I talk to them, and they say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll actually turn it off. I said, well, OK, thank you. So I go back, and I say, yeah, they're going to turn it off. Thanks, man, thanks. And I said, well, what do you do? He says, well, I'm, I, my name is Les. I'm the location manager. It's the first time I ever knew there was a job. Yeah, yeah, OK, yeah. there was a job. Another day, we're on the set. And there's a scene, and they had a local guy they'd cast for this role. And the guy would go, he couldn't, when every time it was time for him to do the role, he would just bust out laughing. He just couldn't get the lines out, he'd bust out laughing. So Gordon's son, David, said, let Kakai do it. So they sent me to makeup and hair, uh, wardrobe. So for that brief moment when the sheriff was coming and that guy, young guy came running in saying the sheriff is coming, that was me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's the thing. It was two lines. Sheriff Tom Hughes is coming and he's going to clean up the town. Well, I didn't do it like that. I did it so fast the first time the whole crew fell out laughing. So after they calmed down, I said, no, we're going to slow it down. So anyway, I came back, slowed it down a bit. And so we... It got cut to Sheriff Tom Hughes is coming, right? But after I did it, I went to Art. I said, well, how did I do, Art? Eh, you did okay, uh, not like an actor. And I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but, but the thing about with being around Gordon, more than anything that he ever told me was me being able to observe him work, to observe him interacting with the actors, interacting with the crew, and interacting with a, a stodgy production manager. Now, how many of you filmmakers in here? Any? Okay, so you know about being a production manager, watching the budget, and I can remember them having an argument close to the set about the budget and something, but I watched how Gordon handled it. And so that was a thing that really, that was really watching him work and watching how he dealt things was what really I got from him. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's the key. So, Art, you, I mean, you, again, I, I knew you were an actor before you did this. You had done a number of things. And so your background in acting is, is vast. It's, it's decades long. So it, when you first got this job with, uh, with Gordon, how was that? How, what happened and how did that operate? I was living in New York. Oh, here's, your, oh, sorry, here's your mic. We're, we're filming this. I was, yes, I was living in New York. Can you hear me out there in the balcony? <laughs> I was living in New York, and I was playing the village coffee houses, and I was just really pretty much getting, learning how to play guitar. Mm -hmm. And um, I had this raggedy guitar that I got from a, from some, somebody was playing a guitar and it got broken, they gave it to me and I said, oh great, it was wonderful. <laughs> um, but uh, I remember, I was an actor and I'd done Broadway off Broadway, off off Broadway, <laughs> off 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 of Broadway, and uh, <laughs> your name's Iowa, <laughs> <laughs> which is where we met. Is that right? Yep, yeah. Iowa. Mm -hmm. I, but but uh, I also played coffee houses, colleges, uh, business parties uh, as well, and I traveled around the country doing it. And um, um, Gordon Parks, so I went out for Lead Belly, and Gordon Parks was one of the people that was there uh, auditioning people. And I, s I walked in, I was very nervous. I could act, I could handle the acting, but the guitar work was a little difficult because I was just beginning to learn to play guitar. I was confident for my songs, but not to play for anyone else. And um, this young lady who was in the movie as the dancer uh, needed someone to play guitar for her because she didn't have any music. And I was faking it anyway, like I could play guitar. And uh, so I, they asked me, would I play for her? I said, no, it's, oh, God. Because yeah, I didn't know how to play that well. So I, we rehearsed a little bit. and I, Then we, we went on. And um, surprisingly, 
surprisingly, she did really good singing and dancing. And I didn't do too bad on the guitar. I, I was able to get by it without anybody detecting it, that I, I got better as we, I got more confident as I did more performances and, and studied and played more guitar, teaching myself. By the time I got to Led Belly and was playing, I could play really good. Mm -hmm. And um, Roger, I helped him look like he could play. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, and for me, I mean, I knew how to I knew how to play, but I was not that confident because I hadn't, hadn't played uh, as much as I would have liked to. Uh, Bob Dylan was a big Richie Haven, big. I loved those those two guys very much, and I wanted to play like them. And I didn't know if I had. Um, I didn't know how to do that. I was teaching myself, but evidently I did pretty good. As the film shows, I was surprised to myself. How was it like working with Gordon? Gordon hired me. Um, he hired me the first day I auditioned. Mm. And uh, that's pretty weird. I've only had that happen to me in the, the how many years have I been Acting, yeah. babe. Eight, five. Fifty-five years. Fifty-five years. <laughs> wow. And uh, this is the first time something like that has happened. And it happened to me. And he, and he, uh, he liked me very much. And he liked the songs I sang. And he liked the way I did the role when I read. He, I thought he, I was a little afraid because. I said, wow, I, can get, I, I got the part because I knew I got the part because the director doesn't make that much of my commit himself that much like that and this is Gordon Park senior whoa you know and and um he asked me to play for the other girl who and I said I don't know how to play for anybody I just know how to play for me so I had to fake it and she and she and I got together and rehearsed and we did a good job Gordon hired her and he hired me that's great that's great one thing yeah that's that's incredible one of the things that Kyle had said that then Gordon hired him on the first meeting. Gordon, I think he has this sense of people. Because, um, you know, he, he just when he meets you, he makes the decision. He's not one of those people that, like, his, mi his mind is so clear. And it's really interesting. This is, this is half past autumn when we were in Brazil. This is my own ego. Um, we were looking for a place to shoot him shooting Flavio. And he, he, we're in the van. He sees, he goes, this is the place you should shoot. I said, no, 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 we want to go farther down the road. We drove an hour away and he ended up coming back to the first place Gordon had picked. It was like, I said, I said, okay, I, I, you are the master. I, you are, I, I don't know what made me think I could do better than you, but it was really, it was one of those things. That he had this ability to just make decisions quickly and he was usually right about them right away. And it's, it's hard in this business because you're always second guessing yourself, trying to maybe I look for something better. So, um, uh, you in this role uh, really had to find some level because it was it was sort of comical too at some points in time. Did Gordon give you the direction for that, or was that something that you Gordon's and Ryan? for Lead Belly? Or yeah, for Lead Belly. Yes, for Lead Belly. Uh, Gordon. Uh, uh, got mic, sorry. Oh, sorry. Gordon. He uh, he was very patient, and when he when he spoke, everybody listened. Uh, I listened. Uh, I was there when I wasn't supposed to shoot because I wanted to learn something from him. And uh, I had never done a movie before, and this was a big Paramount film. And um, with the people I admired in the arts who were in the, the film, and they did a wonderful job. And I was always learning as much as I possibly could. And um, it's like uh, I wanted to learn. So I did films in foreign countries. I did about 18 films in foreign countries. Oh, and, and, you know, so it was kind of difficult for me to, um, I just need to learn the best way to do that is to communicate with the individuals yeah. who were out there trying to learn as well. Like, for instance, when you and I met, mm -hmm. well, um, we, it was, it, it was a, you have a great memory. Mm -hmm. Very good memory. Uh, 
Because I, I knew I knew you from some place, right. you know. Yeah. But you, you're too young looking for somebody <laughs> for me to know. <laughs> and sure enough, it was like you were in just out of high school. Just out of high school. Yeah, I was just getting to college. You know, and uh, I was very impressed with you, very impressed. Uh, because of, I didn't deal with very many young black men. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's how it happened, is that they were the colleges here were needed for other colleges, student activities, right? And so they were looking for black acts to come to the colleges because most of the acts were, you know, jugglers or white, whatever, you know. And so that's so that's where we were out. So it was like, there's this group. I forgot the name of the group. That's what I did. Divided for. we stand. Yeah, yeah. So it was this Three radical ways. black group of actors and stuff like. That. So, but that's what it's about. But you have this ability as a performer because a lot of people have seen your work over the years. I mean, and, and they and they respect you for it. And I just thought that it was interesting in this film. I I don't know when the first time I saw this film, I I didn't necessarily see the comedy. Interestingly enough, I just was so into. Gordon has a sense of sort of what's uh, realistic filmmaking with a naturalist feel, and I think if you saw this film, you'd realize it's actually almost a musical. It is. It has a very, very respect for the the, the African American culture, specifically in the South. Um, that those are elements that are in his work, and, and not so much in Shaft, but that's a different film. But in if you look at Le Learning Tree in this one, and and. Uh, Oliver uh, um, Solomon Northrop, yeah, I, I see. There's an incredible love of nature, a love of the environment, love of sunsets, you know, and and the and the way that people behave is not, not in the actor sense, but in the naturalistic sense, which is something that you're known for. So, and so that, that life humor was really stronger in this film than in other ones. Go ahead. You know, you could really see though some of his early work, uh, photography. Uh, 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 for the depression and for the, from the where he did where he traveled around and, and shot the migrant workers and he shot the people you could the see that in, too. you could you could see that in you could see that in the shots in the film yeah 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 and it, it, yeah especially I mean he, I, I, it's interesting this weekend has been or this last couple of weeks has been great because I watched everything shaft everything back to back he loves shooting into the sun. He loves sunsets. He loves that natural feeling, which is not really in a lot of specifically um, African-American filmmakers. That's not what they see. They're really going for the urban feel. They're going for more the slick look. And Gordon really wants the trees and the grass and the rivers and the water and the horses and, you know. Those that's, are, that, that's, that, yeah. that's that home background. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, that's what he grew up in. Yeah. That's what, you know, yeah. he saw the trees. Mm -hmm. He saw all of that, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. It's, you know, it just comes through in him and his personality, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Good. I see that. Yes, good questions. Questions, you see questions here? Any questions here that people are, uh, comments? I mean, what did you think about the movie? There's Let's start there, there first. There's one up there, first up there. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Up there, question, yeah, Andre? Uh, first of all, the track wasn't low. The track was up as far as the volume, mm -hmm. which was excellent. Mm -hmm. And if anybody realized any of us were musicians in here, against the chords of the songs, the strings were, were, were doing dissonant chords. There was a tension in some of those, which for the year the film was made, it was very modern. Mm -hmm. As far mm -hmm. as the music was yeah. very good. Yeah. And also the pantomime was good, because uh, I know Roger. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but you know what I got is two thirds of the way through the film when they did the pan of inside the chain gang house. Mm -hmm. Each of those shots was a still. Yeah. yeah. It was like a cinematographer, yeah. photographer. Each of those shots when they saw each one of those men's faces when they did the pan, I said, I wish I had a still of that. Mm -hmm. oh. mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, yeah. There, there were yeah. parts of the film which were from that time. But what I saw too is scope. Yeah. yeah. Breath and yeah. width would normally David Lee mm -hmm. had the budget, you know, to go to Egypt. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. For what they had to work with, I, I got I got width yeah. and width out of it. Yeah. It was very good and the music was very good. Yeah. yeah. You know, as a location manager, that is one of the problems that we really have is that you go and you look for stuff and you see the, the full scope. And then you see the cut film, and it's like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And that that really just, you know, why did we really go look for all this when you shoot it like that? But then Gordon yeah. really did do that. He yeah. really did keep that width and that, that scope in it, yeah. Yeah, he did. It, 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 it's, it's, uh, it reminds me of, of David Lean, reminds me of John Ford. There's, you know, the, the doorway shots and yeah. the landscapes yeah. and yeah. the long shots, were, especially when they, she came to the field and pouring the water or, or getting him the water and he pours on her. I mean, that's all done in the wide shot. And, and I'm sure... It, in filmmaking, you want to get in closer, get in closer. Yeah, you want to see each drop. Yeah, of the yeah right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's just, but just be, be, live in the environment. Other questions, comments out there in yes. the middle there, gentlemen? Yeah, the get the mic first. I'm sorry, we couldn't hear you. Uh, Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee were listed as in the musical credits, and I'm wondering if Gordon Parks knew them before the production or how they got rolled into the film? I, I believe he did. I believe he did. I knew them. I had an opportunity to perform with them. Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee. And Brownie McGee uh, was blind. And, uh, he, and he played several uh, string instruments and well. And they, all, they both play well. Uh, and I... Troubadour played with him at the Troubadour in LA and the Troubadour in New York and other and a few other clubs. I was honored to be able to be in their presence. That's how much we, they loved and respected because they are extremely exceptional artists. Um, and I, I wasn't expecting them to be brought up, but I'm so delighted that uh, that you did. And by, uh, and uh, so I just confirmed the fact they were wonderful artists. Consummate. Let me ask you, did it take you a while to get used to the contacts or whatever for your eyes, or how did that go? Uh, yeah, I was wearing new contacts that had never been, you know, used before, and I'd never worn contacts before. So when Gordon told me that I would have to wear contacts, they were thinking, let's let's do let's put him in, you know, let's we don't want to make it gaudy. But we want to put it in context that can be seen. And it would be, you know, I said, well, I could do it without context. And Gordon said it would be better with context. And I said, okay, I'll give it, I'll be glad to do it with context. I just want to, you know, and Gordon, and Gordon was so easy to work with. Oh, man. But anyway, I wore the context. And one day something got into my eye. Was, and, Another con, and it had to be, it hurt so bad because in those days the, the contacts were not like this, they were like that. I mean, they were big contacts. We had to have surgery to put them in. It took, uh, it took five guys to put them in. And, cause they need three guys to hold me down. <laughs> you know, and two guys to put them in. And then one guy to talk me into it psychologically to get used to them. And that was just for a snapshot. So uh, that, I don't want to go on and on and on. So no, no, please. you're fine. Um, I remember the conversations, though, with Uncle Gordon um, about the struggles that he had with the studio, um, the, the battles of wanting to do this film the way he wanted to do this film. And with all that he had achieved in his career and as brilliant as this film was, them not wanting him to uh, allow in him to um, do it the way he wanted to do it. And there were many battles. And I remember Daddy, when he came home, um, he, shared, he shared with me um, hearing Uncle Gordon having an argument at the arguments. And I don't know if you could talk That's more about saying, yeah. yeah. Talk about that a little bit, Kakai. Um, and that's why the, the release was limited. That's why a number of audiences hadn't seen it. And Uncle Gordon, he had, it was kind of, it there was an opportunity, probably they, there were talks about re-releasing it. But you, yeah. were, you, were, you, know, you were there, Kakai. No, that was the saying, by watching him, because I saw those arguments. Mm -hmm. And I was talking about the production manager who's always squeezing the budget. You know, that's, I mean, that's their job. Uh, uh, and they're not necessarily that uh, creative-minded. They're more budget-minded. But I, you know, I was right there watching this, so, so I could see how he handled his 
working with the crew, his working with the cast, and then how he could flip the switch and deal with those other arguments that had to be fought. And uh, later on, I mean, I'm on my second film set, so I don't know. But then, you know, I watch the other directors that I work with. I never see that happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, uh, back when I did Color Purple, you know, um, you know, it was thought, and I don't know how far it was up that Gordon should have directed that film. Yeah, yes, right. you yes know, he was up for it. Uh, and he was up for it, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, you know, and uh, Quincy Jones was the, one of the producers, and that was my first film. I'd done, you know, like the A-Team and Knight Rider and all those television shows before that. Um, but, you know, the thing was, you definitely were not going to have that argument with Spielberg, mm -hmm. okay? So if it was going over budget, he would just say, this is what we're doing, and this is what would happen, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, but how much different the picture would have been? I mean, my talks with Alice Walker, I'll just say this, and this is not on this film, this is just on that. Uh, and I talked to the producer, Kathleen Kennedy, about it during the time, that why did Mr. become the redeemer in the end of the picture? Because that's not what it is in the book. Yeah, no. You see, yeah. they, that, that was a story of faith and belief of those, that family coming back together. And I remember her telling me, well, you know, Stephen wanted it that way and da 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 da, da. Well, Alice wasn't necessarily all that happy with it either, yeah. you know. So, yeah. but... <laughs> The point is, would it ever been that had it been Gordon? Yeah. Because the, the relationship of Gordon and Alice, they, they were the same kind of people. Yeah. Or are, you know, they were the same kind of people, and, and, and having dealt with her, and, and then having known Gordon. So it's really interesting what a different film it might have been. Yeah. Gordon did come and do stills, and I was, it was really a good thing for me for him to see that his work had paid off, yeah. that I had made it, or made it. I was in the business, and, and, and his allowing me to come, uh, uh, that I had taken enough note to be able to, to work on that level. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, you know, but he, yeah. he had to fight. He yeah. had to fight. Gordon, I mean, I think that he, as calm as Gordon is on the exterior, there's, a, there's definitely, I always call it, the, he has this little savage inside of him. Yes, I mean, yes. you, you know. Yeah, he, he, as I, he was telling me about the fighting for Richard Roundtree to have the mustache. I mean, they didn't want a black man, to, the studios would, did not want the black man to have a mustache. I don't understand why, but they did not want it. They thought it made him too, I, I don't know what they thought it was, but, it, they, but he fought for that to the point that he was willing to walk away from the picture. For, because the picture was actually his idea. The, initially, it was a white detective, Gordon forced the hand to have a black man and turned into a black picture. And, and, and Ernest Tittleman thought it was a great idea to do that because he had already done French Connection and High Plains Drifter as a writer. So he was like, let's do something different. And it, it also turned into, he, Tittleman did six books off a of shaft. He wrote, he wrote six movies off a of shaft and a TV series off a of shaft. So this was like his, he was, he knows he made the right decision, but it, it was, Gordon had that, I had the, Robin knows this story. When I was doing Half Past Autumn, Gordon wanted to make another movie. Um, and, and he wrote the script. I read the script. And he, because of his age, he needed a younger director that was in DJ that could s sort of, just in case, you know. And so I, told, I said I would do that. But there was something about the studios that didn't necessarily see Gordon. What you guys saw in this work, they just didn't see him. They either saw... Either he was too rebellious, or they knew he was going to fight them, or or just because he was black, he was going to make his movie. Regardless of how uh, they try to push back on him, and it's unfortunate because I think it would have it, it was a contemporary story about a Let young black kid that got a scholarship to go to an exclusive white school in Manhattan. And it was a great script, and it really made sense for him at his age to make this kind of story because, we, because of what Robin was talking about, about how do we, what are we going to do with young black men. Um, and it was about that. He's out of his neighborhood. He was going to a school. He was getting pushed back because he was going out of his neighborhood to go to school, to an all-white school, and he was getting pushed back in the white school. Um, I thought it was a brilliant piece, but he could not get that off the ground. I'm sorry, go ahead. So the... the Probably the main reason was it wasn't the cookie cutter movie that they wanted. Mm -hmm. They wanted a bunch of this language, that language, 
you know what I mean? And, you know, we're going to knock somebody down and da da da. Not something that was going to be cerebral. Yeah. And that's what Gordon was going to give them. And they were looking at that money that, you know, is it going to be, is it going to match what's going on now? Because they don't see that. You know, they, it, 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 the studio is, you know, right now it's the big action fi pictures, it's the big marvels, it's all of that stuff. But he was going to bring something totally different for the thinking minds, just like you talk about the distribution of Lead Belly. Mm -hmm. Now, in the reality, if they had really, really known, the majority of Lead Belly songs were more popular in the white community right. than they are in the black community. Good Night Irene, all of those songs were really more prevalent. So they could have done a whole different campaign mm -hmm. right. just based on those songs that would have had a far-reaching audience. But again, once they saw the color of the people in the movie, they narrowly looked at it. Yeah. And that's how they were narrowly looking at Gordon. He's not bringing me a black movie as we perceive black to be. Right. He's not bringing us black people as we perceive black to be with a mustache? Oh, no. You know, that's like, for them, that's like what? A fro or, yeah. you know, dashiki or, <laughs> yeah, you know, like oh, dashiki. my God, we yeah. can't have that. Right, yeah. Right. And just really quickly, because I want to hear from the audience, but when he healed, PBS called him to do Solomon Northup's Odyssey, 12 Years a Slave. And he was excited. Yeah, he and he was, called, yeah. and in fact, he said, well, baby, did you come out here and kind of spend some time on this project? <laughs> yeah. I, did, yeah. I don't know what I had going on big, I mean, but I did get to go to the premiere um, <laughs> with him um, in D.C., 12 Years a Slave. Mm -hmm. And so that was yeah. the first. He did it first. It just, Yes. Solomon uh, North Odyssey. Odyssey. That, that'd be in the next yeah. Choice Cinema series. Yeah. Avery yeah. Brooks, yeah. amazing. Wonderful, wonderful. A it incredible. was amazing. So before the one that the Paul Vlad brothers produced, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and so we need to know, we need to know that. And I went to a screening of that one mm -hmm. at the Walker Art Center, and there was no mention, and even the promo mm -hmm. of that movie, that Gordon Parks made that film first. Yeah. And so we need to know. So in the new issue of Minneapolis St. Paul 50th anniversary issue, there's a nice little piece about Gordon Parks. So I'm proud of yeah, them for that. So let's do our research and know what he did. But I did bring that up at the screening. The man who was a descendant of slaves made the film first. Yeah, yeah. And he was very excited to be able to do that. And I encourage people to see it. It's, it's um First of all, Bill Pollard is a friend of mine, so I, I told him I said, you know, I like, and I told him I said, Bill, you should see the, I mean, this movie. I mean, because it's a different take on it, and that's in, that's that's anybody's right as a director. It really is about Solomon. This Solomon Northrop is really about in the pain of a man who was born free, ultimately put into slavery, and um, so it focuses on his feeling on the on how he. He, uh, he, what he's going to do to get free, a little bit more so than, than 12 Years a Slave, which is a, a statement about slavery in and of itself. Um, and I, that's okay, too. You know, I, you know it's, it is what it is. Um, any other comments out there? I know we're supposed to wrap this up. Is somebody in the back there, is it uh, the white shirt, T-shirt? I'm sorry. You got your hand up? Yeah, you? Oh, okay. Uh, I'm going to just introduce myself to everybody. My name is Free Hickman. Uh, who you know as the great Dr. Robin Hickman, I know as Auntie Robin. Yeah. <laughs> um, I am the youngest son of Bobby Hickman's oldest son. Um, Gordon Parks was my great uncle. Uh, unfortunately, I never got the chance to meet him. So that's why uh, I'm glad you three are up here. I just wanted to ask, besides from like, you know, the filmmaking and all that great stuff he did as a man, what were some of the things that still sit with you that you've learned to this day? Well, you know, it's, to me, in a, in a lot of times, I, I speak at like USC Film School and other places, it's daring to do or do stuff or be different or to try new stuff. I mean, him picking up the camera, him believing he could do fashion photography, him believing he could do this. I mean, the learning tree. I mean, I don't, you just don't know, being 
First of all, he wrote the book, okay? He wrote the novel. Then he wrote the screenplay from the novel. Then he produced the film, he directed the film, and he wrote the score. I mean, who does all that? I mean, Prince may have played all the instruments in, in, in his song, but when, when you get to a studio film, you know, and I can really imagine from him going from all of that to get over here to have some guy tell you about how you should make your film. See, that's what I can really understand why he was where he was in some of those arguments that I saw. So I just, <clears throat> it was a thing that I wrote once, I said, um, I'm following your footsteps, but I'll never be able to fail them. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, but deep. It's, uh, it's, it's just amazing to me. Yeah. It's just amazing. I think that's for me, too. And, I, and that's, it's, hard, it's hard to, it's always trying things. And, and one of the things that we were, when we shot the documentary that was, we had set, started to do this was his creation of Essence magazine. Yes. I mean, do you understand? He, he did that. A black female magazine during that period of time that's still around to this day. And where does that come from? Where, how do you do that yeah, stuff? Exactly. Which you've never done it before. Yes, he worked at Life Magazine, but he had never made a magazine that's actually still around to this day. I mean, you know, I mean, Life is still around to this day. Those kinds of things are what I learned from him is tr try things. Don't limit yourself in your mind. He, and he always was pushing to try it, see what happens. He did an opera, he did a ballet. Do this, you know, don't start restricting yourself. And I think that's one of the things, to your point, that I got from him, you know. Um, so, you know, let me just say one quick thing. And for him to say to you, do you think I did anything? Yeah. That's, he said that. Yeah. You know, that's how much more he wanted to do. Yes. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And I mean, in part of it, well, you were there, Robin. When he, I mean, when the black kids were, mugged him. I mean, it was like, it's like he couldn't. I think that was more impactful for him. I mean, he's Gordon Parks for Christ's sake, and he's an old guy, and they, and he gets mugged in in Manhattan. Right. It's like it was like, whoa, what's going on here, you know? Um, but to that point, when we were shooting in Harlem, we were shooting uh, um, with the. Uh, the family and, and that lived up in Harlem. I forgot uh, the uh, not Fontanelles. The, Fontanelles. Okay, so we're on the street and he was out there with us and we were shooting. He took pictures of, of Richard and I was in these kids who saw all this equipment and stuff and so they 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 surrounded us until they saw Gordon and they just said, "Oh my God, it's Gordon Parks!" It literally like they just they were their whole attitude changed. It was like. It was like it was like the Messiah had come to Harlem. It was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. It wasn't. We didn't need to call the cops. We didn't need to act tough. It's just this is Gordon, and they just like totally backed off. And they wanted they wanted autographs. It was, they turned into these kids. It was the most amazing thing. He has that, and that's and I think when we talk about what he couldn't or specifically make in films, what they didn't allow him to do, they didn't understand who he was. They right. really didn't. They liked it him kind of, but they didn't understand the power of this man and his influence on the world. We'll let Art have the last one. Yeah, I see yeah. yeah, I do, yeah I do. The too. ladies up here, we'll let Art, you have, <laughs> you have any slides? You good? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just so amazed. I'm learning so much from Kai. I'm learning so, it's interesting. I mean, I spent years behind a microphone in <laughs> lectures and performing, and, and this is the fifth time I had to be told to put the microphone up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say. Um, I feel, but that's kind of the situation I've gotten myself into, or, or my, I've been brought to discussing Gordon Park Sr. It's, I, as much as the testimony here, it is very difficult for me to even get that close to what it was like to be able to work for Gordon Park Sr. when I was just basically a kid myself, uh, to be able to listen to him and for him to be able to connect with me. My mother and father never encouraged me to go into show business. They didn't, they didn't deter me you know, or, or get in the way. Um, my brothers and sisters didn't care the older ones and the younger ones. And when I met Gordon, Gordon Park Sr., I was basically a, ch a kid myself. I had done a, a movie and I scored the music for it because it was just all me. And I could just do what I want. 
and uh, nobody knew anything about music, not even me, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's just to, to hear these two gentlemen, and, and of course, um, Gordon Parks, uh, have Gordon Parks Sr.'s uh, uh, kinship here. I'm so honored, I wanna make sure that I really say what I really mean because it's so important for me to be able to be here for this. And it's difficult for me to express to you how, how important it is. So I don't wanna make myself look like a fool or look badly, yeah. but yeah. I really liked, love Gordon Park so much. He brought me, he's the one who discovered me at his audition and put me in his film and then he put me in Solomon Northrop's Odyssey, that film as well. So I got an opportunity to look, live with him and work with him and get to know Gordon. And he took me up under his wing to teach me a lot of things. And I was so delighted that I had no other request but to do this conference here. And I hope I'm invited back again. I've yeah. enjoyed myself. Yeah. Thank, you. Good. thank you. Very good. And thank let's, you. Uh, let's give everybody a round of applause. Kakai, Robin. Art, and I want to make sure Amy and, and the people here at Landmark get their due. This is because of them, and hopefully the, the situation in St. Paul will continue to grow, because as St. Paul born and bred people, except for you, Art, but you can be an honorary St. Paul. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Take care. Right. Have a good night. <laughs>